You are so confusing. You say you love us, but what, what kind of God allows war? What's going on there? Who are you? The Old Testament showed a wrath and a harshness from God that is totally absent through Jesus. Jesus presented a different view of God, and that's why he's persecuted. Well, which is the real God? Will the real God please stand up? That's what we're going to talk about today, so stay tuned for the Gospel Truth. Welcome to Gospel Truth with Andrew Womack, a teaching ministry that emphasizes God's unconditional love and grace. And now, here's Andrew. Welcome to our Wednesday's broadcast of the Gospel Truth. Today I'm continuing a series that I've been on for three weeks now talking about the true nature of God. And we've produced a new, improved, expanded version of my old teaching on this. It's the same teaching. It's just, actually it covers some questions and some deals with some things in detail that I didn't deal with on the original series. But it's the same teaching. It's new and improved. And I encourage you, if you've missed any of this teaching, to please take advantage of this product that we're offering because I believe it could really change your impression about the nature and the character of God. Basically, we've been saying that people misinterpreted God's dealings in the Old Covenant because of His harshness and wrath, and they have thought that that's the way that God really is. And yet the Bible says in 1 John chapter 4, verse 8, that God is love. Now, God isn't wrath. God is love. But He has expressed wrath. And because of that, some people have taken that as being his true nature. This is the way God really is. They see God as an angry, harsh God. And there's certainly biblical evidence for that. In the Old Testament, there was a harshness and a wrath of God. But one of the things that I have done in this teaching is to show you that the Old Testament law was only temporary. God waited 2,000 years after the fall of Adam, Adam before he gave the Old Testament law. And then it was only temporary until Jesus should come. And since the time of Jesus, God has not been dealing with us according to the Old Testament law. So the Old Testament law wasn't inaccurate, but it was incomplete. You know, I've given examples uh, how people can take an action of a person and think that this is the way they are, but, but really you're misrepresenting it. You need to look at the whole thing. You know, there's times that I have been very strong. There's times that I've had a godly anger come up on the inside of me, and I've dealt with things, and I've been harsh at times when I had to be harsh, but that is not really my nature and characteristics. You know, if somebody was to break into our home and threaten my wife, and threaten something like that, I guarantee you I'm not one of these pacifists that would lay down and just take it. Now, if they were coming against us for the sake of the Lord, you know what, I'd turn the other cheek. But if they're coming against us for that $100 bill or whatever, you know, I'd tell them that, man, you better be willing to die for this because I'm going to fight you to the death. I am not going to give place to things like that. And some of you may disagree with that, and that's fine. That's not my point. I'm just saying that this is the way I am. And yet, you could see me defending myself. If somebody was trying to attack my wife, I think it's love. A person who says that they love their wife and yet would allow them to be raped or robbed or, you know, something terrible done to them because they, they just are a pacifist, I don't believe that's true love. Love has to have a hate to it. God is love, but because he loves us, he also hates evil because evil is against everything that God planned. It is out to destroy his whole purpose, and God hates evil. So the, to love God, you have to truly hate evil. And for God to be love, he has to hate those things that are trying to come against his creation and destroy it. And so there are times that God has vented his wrath. And some people have taken those times and thought, so God, this is the way he is. He is a very angry, harsh, legalistic, bitter God. That's the way that he is. No, that's a misrepresentation, a misunderstanding. And I think that the way that you really see the true nature of God is to go back and see the way that he dealt with man from the very beginning. And if you can get this put into its perspective and recognize it was over two 
2,000 years after the fall of man until God really began to start releasing his punishment upon sin. And if you can understand that that ended at the time of Jesus and in the day that we live in, actually since the time of Jesus for 2,000 years, God has not been imputing man's trespasses unto them. So for the uh, basically the first for the 6000 years that we've lived since the fall of Adam there's only been 2000 of those years that God brought judgment upon sin. Now he's been credited with doing things. People will say God is the one that brought the hurricanes and the tsunamis and earthquakes and destruction and that this is God's judgment, but that's not what the Bible teaches. Since the time of Jesus God placed his judgment upon Jesus and God is not imputing man sins unto them today. So out of those 6,000 years since the fall of Adam and Eve, God is actually the vast majority of time, two-thirds of the time, he has been operating in super mercy towards the human race, but he hasn't always gotten credit for this. And sad to say, the church is one of the areas that is misrepresenting God's dealings. So that's the reason I'm teaching on this. So I was talking yesterday out of Romans chapter 5, verses 8, 9, and 10. We read those scriptures about if you can accept that God loved you when you were still a sinner so much that he died for you, much more now should you be able to accept God's love for you now that you are born again. And yet many people find it much harder to ex receive God's love now that you're born again than it was before you got born again. They accepted salvation and receive that, but man, they can't get healed of a cold. They can't see financial prosperity. They receive this huge gift of salvation, but they can't receive these minor things like healing of cancer and deliverance from demons and emotional healing. Those are minor compared to our gift of salvation. And so it says this in Romans chapter 5, verse 11, And not only so, but we also joy in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom we have now received the atonement. Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. You know, I haven't got time to go into this in great detail but this is a powerful truth and it really supplements what I've been teaching here. Most people think they became a sinner, separated from God, and became a sinner because of the things that they have done. But this is saying by one man, sin entered into the world. Sin didn't enter into the world through you individually. Sin entered into the entire human race through Adam. And then every child that has ever been born since Adam was born with a sin nature. It's not your individual acts of sin that make you a sinner, but it is your sin nature, the fact that you are a sinner by nature that causes you to commit those individual acts of sin. Well, that is a radical truth with a lot of application. I'm not going to stop there and talk about that, but that is a powerful truth. And then in verse 13, notice this. This is Romans 5:13. For until the law, sin was in the world, but sin is not imputed when there is no law. That is one powerful piece of information. Look at this. It says, For until the law, sin was in the world, but sin is not imputed when there is no law. Now look at this. Until the law means what? This is talking basically about the time of Moses. And so until the time of Moses, sin was in the world. But sin wasn't imputed. The word impute here is an accounting term. And it's used to say that uh, something is held against you. And I've used this example in previous teachings. But when we use a credit card, in a sense what you're doing, you are imputing those charges under your account. When you give that person your credit card, the person isn't actually charging you at that moment. You do not have the money come out of your bank account. You, are, you aren't paying for it at that moment. Well, what you're doing is giving them information that allows them to put this on your account and then they send you a statement and you have to pay your credit card or they'll take legal action against you. But what happened was you imputed that charge to your account. It was held against you. It was put on the books. If you were to uh, say, for instance, 
I did this one time. I held a meeting in Arlington, Texas, and we used an American Express uh, credit card to pay for those charges, and yet six months later, we had never been billed. And because we were honest, we went back and researched why we had never been billed and found out that the lady who handled our account got fired, I guess, for the way that she handled our account. And so she never put all of those things on the books and it never was imputed unto us. It was not charged to us. And because we were honest, we went back and told them and then they imputed it unto us and we had to pay that $3,500 charge. But see, I gave them our information. But for whatever reason, it wasn't put on our account. That would mean that it wasn't imputed unto us. Well, this is saying that until the time that God gave the law, sin wasn't imputed. That didn't mean that sin wasn't happening. It didn't mean that people weren't living an immoral life, but God wasn't imputing it unto them. He wasn't putting those sins on his ledger books. He wasn't holding it against them. It was just as if those people hadn't sinned. God was not punishing them and dealing with people according to their sins. What a radical, radical statement. So that means until the time of Moses, nearly 2,000 years after the fall of Adam, during that first 2,000 year period of time, as a general rule, God was not imputing men's trespasses unto them. Now, now that is radically different than what most people think. Most people think that the moment Adam and Eve sinned, that this holy God got ticked off, angry, drove them out of the Garden of Eden because he couldn't stand them anymore. They were now unholy and God immediately began to start imputing their sins unto them, holding their sins against them. That's not what the Bible says. And right after our break, I'm going to come back and begin to start showing this to you from Scripture. And I think it's going to make a difference in the way that you see the true nature and character of God. So I just made some radical statements out of Romans 5.13 that basically until the time of Moses, nearly 2,000 years after the fall of Adam and Eve, God did not impute our whole people's sins against them. He dealt with people in mercy and grace. And then you can turn over to 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 19 and that verse says, to wit, or that is, that God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing men's trespasses unto them. So if you put all of this together, Romans 5.13 says that for the first 2,000 years after the fall of Adam and Eve, God wasn't imputing men's trespasses unto them. And then 2 Corinthians 5.19 says that from the time of Christ, God has not been imputing men's trespasses unto them. So that means for the basically the 6,000 years that we've lived on the earth since the fall of Adam and Eve, there is 4,000 years of that time that God has not been imputing men's trespasses unto them. He's been treating us separately, differently than our sins deserve. And yet, this 2,000 year period of time where God gave the law and he did impute people's sins unto them, that made such an impression upon people that even in the new covenant when we should not be living under this law mentality that we've got to do this and this and this for God to bless us, even under this 2,000 year period of time that the Bible calls the period of grace, Sad to say, the church has still been imputing people's sins unto them. They've been preaching the Old Testament law, and we haven't been living in the full benefit of living under this covenant of grace. Man, those are some radical statements, and that's quite an indictment against the teachings of the church, and yet I believe that that's all absolutely true. Let's look over here in... Uh, Genesis chapter 3, and let me just show you from Scripture a different way of seeing God's dealing with man. And this is based on the uh, scripture there in Romans 5.13 that says, Until the law, until the time of Moses, which was nearly 2,000 years after Adam and Eve's transgression, until the time of Moses, God was not imputing man's trespasses unto them. So, with that in mind, let's go back and relook at the time that Adam and Eve sinned and when God drove them out of the garden and see if there is a way to look at this in a way that harmonizes with 
Romans 5.13 about God not imputing their trespasses unto them. So I'm not going to read all of this, but Genesis chapter 3 is where Adam and Eve sinned against God and they became naked. They tried to cover their own nakedness. God came and uh, there were consequences to their sin. He said that, man, you are going to, you know, the ground's not going to yield its strength unto you. You're going to earn your, uh, eat your food in the sweat of your own brow. You're going to have to work hard now. And there were consequences to their sins. But look down here in Genesis chapter 3 and in verse 22 it says, And the Lord God said, Behold, the man is become as one of us to know good and evil. And now, lest he put forth his hand and take also of the tree of life and eat and live forever, therefore the Lord God sent him forth from the garden of Eden to till the ground from whence he was taken. Now notice in verse 23 it says, Therefore the Lord sent him forth. The word therefore means, you know, I often say it this way, that when you see the word therefore, you're supposed to look and see what it's there for. It links verse 23 with verse 22. It's saying the reason God did what he did in verse 23 is because of what was stated in verse 22. So let's go back and look at this. Verse 22 says, The Lord God said, Behold, the man has become as one of us to know good and evil. And now, lest he put forth his hand and take also of the tree of life and eat and live forever, therefore the Lord God sent him forth from the garden. Why did he send him forth? Well, people have just, you know, jumped to conclusions and thought, well, here's holy God, and now man was unholy. They had become sinners, and holy God cannot tolerate sin. Sin's got to be judged, and so God drove Adam and Eve out of the garden as punishment. Did you know that that kind of mindset actually comes from the Old Testament law? <clears throat> Under the Old Testament law, it showed God's hatred for sin and God's judgment upon sin. It showed God imputing people's sins unto them. And so you see things like God hitting people with botch and mildew and all kinds of things, striking them with cancers and God's judgment and wrath coming. Those kind of things happened under the Old Testament law. And so people who've already got this preconceived idea of God transpose that into this account and they just suppose that here's holy God and unholy man and God's angry and immediately drives Adam and Eve out of his presence because he is angry with them. That's not what this is saying. Again, look at this in verse 22. It says, Now lest he put forth his hand and take of the tree of life and eat and live forever, therefore the Lord God sent the man forth out of the Garden of Eden. Why did he send him out? Not because he was mad at him and wanted to punish him. It was so that he wouldn't eat of the tree of life and live forever. Now some people would say, well, that was punishment. God didn't want us living forever. He was taking away some of the benefits that originally applied to mankind. But you know, if you would stop and think about this for just a moment, <clears throat> you'd find out that this was actually an act of mercy on God's part. So prior to them eating of this tree and introducing all of this sin and sickness into the world, I believe it was impossible for them to be sick and all of these things. And so eternal life was something that was wonderful. But think what it would be like to live forever in a sinful, corrupted body that could be sick. Like just imagine a person who has arthritis and you see their hands becoming gnarled up and their body to where they have intense pain. And it just keeps getting worse and worse and worse. They never get over it. Did you know that for a person like that who knows the Lord and if they have a true relationship with God, they are going to go to heaven and they're going to live forever in a body that cannot become sick. For a person who has all of those problems, death is actually a positive thing. Because they are going to escape that and they're going to live for eternity in a body that is incapable of ever being sick and having those kind of problems. But just imagine what it would be like if you live for a thousand years or two thousand years with your body getting worse and worse. Imagine what it would be like if you had some type of deformity. If you had an arm or a leg amputated or I've got a friend who lost a number of fingers and both legs were blown off in Vietnam and then 
he's nearly uh, blind, he's legally blind, and he has trouble with his hearing and all of these kind of things. Imagine living for a hundred thousand years in a body that's like that and that there is nothing better. Did you know that when God drove Adam and Eve out of the garden, it wasn't because he was mad at them and quit fellowshipping with them, but rather it was because... He didn't want mankind being living forever in that corrupted, sinful body with all of its hurts, with all of its pains. It was an act of mercy to introduce death into the physical race because for those who accepted Jesus and received his salvation, they would be reborn and uh, have a brand new body in heaven, live in a place that was better than what we had here on earth. It was a positive thing. Here's another way of looking at it. Imagine that every person lived forever and that there was no such thing as death. Imagine that we had Hitlers and Pharaohs and all of the Genghis Khans and all of the people in history that were just brutal and demon-possessed and yet you couldn't kill them. You couldn't get rid of them. You just had to try and shut them up someplace. But you know, there would always be the possibility of them escaping and once again, or they could just spew out this poison and pass it on to somebody else. Did you know that death, as bad as it is, in a sinful world, it is better than living forever in this sinful, fallen state? Now, I know that this may be a radical concept to some of you because we hate death so much, but actually, for a Christian, death is a positive thing. It's a way to exit all of the corruption, all of the defilement, all of the weaknesses, the failures, the tendencies of this carnal life. It's a way to exit that and someday we're going to live in a body that cannot be corrupted. We will live in, a, in an existence that is going to be so infinitely better than this one that death is actually a positive thing. And so if you look at it that way, then this is exactly the way it says in Romans chapter 5, verse 13, where it says that until the law, God was not impart, imputing man's sins unto them. He did not drive Adam and Eve out of the Garden of Eden because he was angry at them and was punishing them and doing these things to them. But rather, he drove them out of the Garden of Eden because he loved them and didn't want them living forever in this corrupted, defiled, sinful state. And so he had a better plan for them. He had already prophesied this and... and uh, Genesis chapter 3 verse 15 about how that the seed of the woman would crush the head of the serpent. And so, if you put all of this together, I believe that once again you get a different impression of what God's nature is really like. God was not really the angry, harsh God that drove man out of his presence and wouldn't have anything to do with them. And on our program tomorrow, what I'm going to do is show you even more evidence of this in Genesis chapter 4. But it's exactly like Romans 5.13 says, that until the time of Moses, God was dealing with mankind in mercy, not imputing their